leaders in ministry is sometimes when we get on the topic of doctrine, we argue about um, extraneous matters. It becomes more about the argument than it does specifically about what the Bible says. And, and we miss things. I think it would be probably a lot of times those conversations are more like a family who's just driven off a thousand foot cliff. And on the way down, rather than say bye to each other, they're arguing about how they got in that fix. So um, sometimes we don't do ourselves or others a service. Uh, another, this is just a real life example of it. Years ago, we had a children's program at our church in Montana. And uh, other churches were involved. And, and again, we weren't all on the same page. And I happen to be a Philip Yancey fan. I just think Philip Yancey is a good author. And some of the topics that he writes about, and one of those issues has to do with doubt and just questioning um, where you are in your faith, uh, that sort of thing. He's known for that. Um, and he writes very compellingly. And I think he fits a segment of society that does struggle sometimes. But he's talked about the victory more than he has the struggle. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm mentioning Philip Yancey's name, and he's, um, he's definitely not in the camp that these guys were in. And the, the one fellow practically cursed that Philip Yancey was basically a heretic. Uh, I think that's, that's an issue when we get to that point. Um, let's take and open up Scripture. And let's try and make it speak for itself as much as we possibly can. By the way, I think Mark Moore did an excellent job on the essay this week. So if you haven't read it, read it. So John 10, 28. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Uh, that, by essence, is uh, the doctrine of eternal security. That's where they point to. But I think we need a little bit of context. And we're going to go and we're going to look at, the, at, at a little section of John chapter 10. Now remember what's going on in John chapter 10. At the early part of the chapter, Jesus has been dealing with the Jewish leaders and they're not on the same page. And, and specifically, the Jewish leaders are guilty of stealing, really, the faith of God from the Jewish people. They've been... It's not, and it's not just the Pharisees, it's also the Sadducees, the, the priests and the Levites, they, they haven't been faithful. And, and the Jewish leadership, which should have been taking care of the Jewish people, haven't been. So Jesus teaches this phenomenal section of Scripture where he portrays himself as the Good Shepherd. Most of us know it, or at least we've heard of it. Now when we get to verse 22, there's a little bit of a shift. And, and, well, let's go ahead and look at it. So, then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. So, so obviously there's a shift in time. But notice what happens next. The same theme comes up. The Jews, and when John says the Jews, when he writes that, he is almost always talking about the Jewish leaders. He's not talking about the Jewish people in general, but when he uses that, the Jews, he's referring specifically to the Jewish religious and cultural leaders, predominantly uh, religious leaders. The Jews who were gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now this is a laugh, isn't it? If, if you're a student of Scripture and you're paying attention to this chronologically, and, and for those of you who are visiting, we do have an adult Bible study and we've been going through the life of Christ. What's ironic about this question is he already has answered that question. He's already testified that he's the Messiah, that he's the Son of God. He's already gotten in trouble multiple times, uh, but something's going on inside of them. They, for some reason, these guys just can't accept it. And, and um, so they're in suspense. If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Uh, notice how Jesus answers in verse 25. I did tell you, but you do not believe. 
want to know what's going on? They just don't believe. By the way, just one little side note is, uh, they probably didn't believe because he wasn't the Messiah they had pictured. Uh, things weren't going to continue the way they wanted. There's all kinds of arguments that can, you can make, but they just chose not to believe. They ignored him. Uh, but you do not believe. That's a very accurate charge against them. The works I do, Jesus says, in my Father's name testify about me. And that's also very true. He proved himself to be the Messiah by miracles, wonders, and signs, Scripture tells us. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. So you see, he's returned to that shepherd and sheep thing. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What a great passage, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But remember what it is in context. Now, I, I thought, as I was reading, as I was preparing for this, I, I really thought two quotes by Mark Moore are really important. It, because he does, he, he just kind of uh, deals with the issue of what we call today Calvinism versus Arminianism. And he deals with it, uh, but he deals with it from the scripture point of view. And he's, he's already outlined in the essay several different passages that highlight this issue of security. And, and he says this, so there we have it. Two constellations of scripture that appear to be in conflict. He's not saying they're in conflict, he just says it has the appearance. The first cluster assures us that we're secure in Jesus. There's no doubt about that. The second suggests that we can, in fact, abandon Jesus. How are we to manage that tension? Pastors, here's the second quote, pastors need to promote both sides to maximize ministry in real life settings. And that's so very true. Here's my experience. I've dealt with people on both sides. Unfortunately, I've seen the ugly of uh, too much. And uh, one of the ugly, it's, it's, it's not a surprise to me, you know, having worked in, uh, in the meth treatment program in Montana, and, and probably over a 10 year period, I talked to something in the neighborhood of a thousand um, meth uh, addicts, uh, meth and, and other drugs, but uh, specifically, they were there for meth. Some were believers, they had been believers when they started to use, some weren't. Um, I've shared with you before, there is a direct correlation between their recovery, their ability to recover, and how they view themselves in light of God's forgiveness. Uh, if they believe that they could be forgiven, it, you have a far greater chance you're going to recover and you're going to be addiction free. If you don't believe it's possible, you're likely going to be trapped in addiction for the rest of your life. And, it, and remember, this is a state program. It's a state prison. It's run by a company that's hired out to the state of Montana. But, um, but the, the statistics are out there. The studies are out there about spiritual well-being. So, so when we get to this idea of, of eternal security, there is a huge percentage of people who do question whether their sins could be forgiven by God. And that's a tough nut to crack with a lot of people. You, you have to remember some of the folks that I talked to. One guy confessed to um, cheating on his brother with his brother's wife, turning her to meth, and then turning her out to sell her body so that he could support his meth habit. Now, if you're a person who's finally confronted your guilt and your shame, and that's a big issue, isn't it? I mean, it's easy to understand somebody who would say, there's no way God could forgive me for this. Or is there a possibility God for forgive me? There are people that, you know, they just struggle. They've, they've chosen 
messed over their children. But it's really one of the things that I discovered is there's not a huge amount of difference between a lot of people that are sitting in prison and a lot of people who sit in the pews. Uh, ironically enough, and this is a tough one to swallow sometimes, the only difference is they got caught for it, you didn't. And I'm not saying some of you have done those sort of things, but there's a lot of things that people end up in prison, and it didn't take much in order for them to get there. And a lot of us, I, in my, <laughs> I have troubles with Facebook posts where it says, uh, uh, give yourself one point for each one of these, and it's, you know, like things that you've done. And, uh, like, uh, how many times have you been whipped by the principal? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I didn't think I was a bad kid. I thought I was pretty good. <laughs> <clears throat> but apparently, uh, yeah. There is a difference, though, with those who have chosen these sort of things and they grew up in the church. They accepted Jesus. They were baptized. Um, and they strayed. Man, that security issue for them is big. Because I knew the Lord. I knew the Lord. And I chose to do these things. And there's a lot of folks that are in prison that are in that category. Eternal security is a big issue. Mark Moore uh, approaches it this way. It, one, of, one of the challenges that Calvinists have against Armenians is they, they say basically because of the doctrine, because of the mindset that, that you can lose your salvation that you live in fear all your days. So that's the charge. And it's valid because there are some people that are wired like that. I don't think it's valid, though, in truth. At the same time, for the Calvinists, the Armenians would charge them, say, well, no, Scripture does make it. There's too many if passages, like Colossians chapter 1, um, verse 21 and following. If you continue in your faith, uh, and we're going to hit more here with Hebrews chapter 6. But, but there's just too many passages that say uh, you can throw it away. And unfortunately, I've known those people too. There are people <coughs> who turn their back on God. And they reject the gift of God. And, and boy, it's a sad state to see. I've seen people... I, you know, curse God. I had a, a couple that I was uh, uh, counseling. He cheated on her. And that was the end of the world for her. But mostly because she thought so much of herself. She was a little bit of a princess growing up. She thought so much of herself uh, uh, that she was angry with God that he let her husband cheat on her. And so she cursed God. Um, and it got ugly. And it didn't happen just once or twice. It continued over a period of time. And uh, uh, she got known in town for just how badly she could act. I uh, visited her in jail too, but that's for disruption and uh, causing terror at the hospital. And Yeah. Um, there are people out there like that. I told the story first service. One of the great things about being in second service, you actually get a few more stories. I, had, uh, I take away stuff for them. I uh, add it back for you guys. Uh, Anthony Flew, I would put in this category somewhat. I don't know where he ended up, only the Lord knows. Anthony Flew grew up in a Methodist household. His father was a Methodist preacher. I've mentioned him before. He's written uh, uh, several books. Uh, his last book was the one that I, is, it's on, well, it's not on my shelf, it's electronic, but it's a good book. Uh, this was a guy who grew up in a Methodist household, grew up in a uh, Christian, and when he got to college, he rejected Christ. He said, there is no God. Spent the rest of his life dedicated to philosophy and the argument against, he was an atheist, and he was quoted by other renowned atheists. This was the go-to guy. It, you know, his he was the icon. He, Sean Connery passed away, and he was John, James Bond. You get me? You feel me? You know, for those young kids. Um, 
You know, he, he was, if you were my generation, Sean Connery was James Bond. Anthony Flew was this generation's atheist. He was that big. And he uh, traveled all over the world, and he just combated Christianity in particular. He rejected God in a big way. And in the end of his life, he made friends with a couple of people. One of those is uh, this unknown preacher named N.T. Wright. And uh, became friends with him, and his life was a different arc. And so he wrote a book about coming back to God. And he says, I now believe there is a God. And that was the title of the book, There Is a God. And he said in, in the, the final chapter of his book, he says, uh, if I had to argue for a God, I would probably lean towards the Christian God. But he thanked N.T. Wright for that. He says, I just wish my father had lived long enough to see this transition take place. So all of that said, um, how secure are we in our faith? Um, do we need to?